to enter the Masonic Lodge uh, and take the first introductory uh, pledges. First of all, they blindfold you. They put a noose around your neck. They bury your left chest. You roll up your left pants leg. Take off your left shoe. Kneel before the altar. And, of course, you, know, you take these horrible oaths where you swear. If you ever reveal anything uh, that... Uh, you have heard why in the first uh, degree why they cut out your, take out, tear out your tongue, cut your throat, bury you in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck at low tide so when the tide comes in you're dead if you're not already dead. Second degree, of course, they cut out your entrails and burn them and feed them to the birds of the air. Third degree, uh, they cut out your heart. I mean, it's, by the fourth degree, things are really pretty bad. Adult men swear these oaths, but what you have to understand uh, is that as you're kneeling blindfolded uh, before the altar, before a Bible, Holy Bible, uh, the worshipful master asks you, what do you desire? And you are told to answer the light. You have no idea what the light is, uh, but you answer the light. In the second degree, you're told to ask for more light. And the third degree, you want even more light. Uh, many of you here, I suspect, are born-again Christians, and you've, many of you have prayed the sinner's prayer, and when you pray the sinner's prayer, uh, something happens. Your, your life changes forevermore. I know this happened to me, and it's happened to many people, uh, but when the mason uh, swears this oath, something happens to him too. For he has requested the light to come in and dominate his life. Now this is Albert Pike, the leading Masonic philosopher of the last century, and in his book Morals and Dogma, which was given to every uh, Mason who advanced through the degrees uh, up until 1974, this was the Masonic Bible. And what Pike wrote on page 104, Masonry conceals its secrets from all the, except the adepts and the sages of the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve to be misled to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. In other words, you ask for the light, but we're not going to let you know what the light is. On page 819, the blue degrees are about the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed for the initiate, but he is intensely misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, for it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts and the princes of masonry. He goes on to tell us uh, that on page 722, if you desire to gain admission to the sanctuary, we have said enough to show you the way. And if you do not, uh, it's useless for us to say more, as it has been useless for us to say so much. On page 781, uh, he tells you, if you reflect, my brother, you will no doubt suspect that some secret meaning was concealed in these words. But what's the secret meaning? The, on page 219, the right raises a corner of the veil, even in the degree of apprentice, for there declares that masonry is a worship. So what are they worshiping? Well, on pages 839 and 840, uh, of morals and dogma. And I'm just going to take the bottom paragraph because this is the important one. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute. The absolute is capitalized, reflecting deity. Of this doctrine that is summed up in a word of this word, capital W, deity. In fine, alternately lost and found again, that was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiations. It was the same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated Order of the Templars that became for all secret associations of the Rosy Cross, that's the Rosicrucians, of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. In other words, if you get into these things, you will get power, power that you cannot believe and you will have great wealth, but at what cost? Well, when I went through Professor Quigley's papers, and uh, of course we found the interview with him uh, that we've already discussed, and if you get the interview, you'll actually hear him talking about these crazy right-wingers who come to him, and they show him that symbol, and they tell him that's the symbol of the Illuminati. And he says, that's not the symbol of the Illuminati. That's been around for 5,000 years. That's the symbol of the, uh, the, the mystery religions of antiquity, and that's what it really is. This is the symbol uh, of the mystery religions of Persia and Babylon and, and, 
and Egypt. Uh, this goes back to the ancient pagan religions, uh, which are the basis of all modern-day secret societies. And every single one of them ties into this. Now, uh, you'll recall that we were talking about the Knights Templar. What were the Knights Templar? They were a religious order that in the um, oh, uh, about 1,000, 1,100 went on the Crusades, and they were to guard the temple, where once it stood, Solomon's Temple, Temple Square, where today uh, the great mosque of Almar is. But there, of course, they came in contact uh, with people who were part of the mystery religions. And they came back to Europe uh, in the 1200s, and they became the most significant financial force in Europe. They became the bankers of Europe. And using a fractional reserve banking system, uh, all of the monarchies of Europe became indebted to them, just as governments today spend more than they have. So in those days, they spent more than they had, and the Templars dominated what was going on. But, uh, of course, then it was discovered uh, that the Templars were Luciferian, and Jacques de Molay, their leader, uh, was burned at the stake in the early 1300s. Uh, of course, today, the uh, young people who are sons of, of Masons belong to the de Molays, as did uh, Bill Clinton. Let me read again uh, that final statement on page 840 of Morals and Dogma. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute, of this doctrine that is summed up in a word, of this word, and fine, alternately lost and found again, that is was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiation. It was the same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated order of the Templars that became, for all the secret associations of the Rosy Cross, of the Illuminati, of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason for their strange rites, and of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. What is it about? Well, on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, uh, why uh, Pike lays it right out. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Why, it's simply Luciferianism. If you read Manly P. Hall's a book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, uh, he's very, very clear what it's about. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. That's what it's all about. It's Luciferianism and manifested in every aspect of our society today. Little wonder they want to take God uh, out of our schools. In a book called Spiritual Politics, written by Corinne McLaughlin and Gordon Davidson, a very important book written by people who are involved in the occult, they will explain to you what it's really all about. J.P. Morgan, the great banker, of course, was into astrology. He said his astrology told him how to make his investments to make all of his money. Henry Ford was involved in the occult. Andrew Carnegie was involved in the occult. And Colonel House, the man who was able to control Clemenceau in Orlando and Woodrow Wilson in FDR and be able to go in the room and talk to people uh, and, of course, convince them uh, to take up his ideas. The man who was so intent upon uh, having communism survive when others wanted to do away with it, uh, he was one of the leaders of the occult movement. And, of course, this is why he left a copy of the protocols for those in the future uh, to uncover. And so we begin to see these patterns uh, unfolding. Let me read again what Manly P. Hall said, because this is so important. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Uh, you can read the book, uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, by Barbara Marks Hubbard. Uh, the original manuscript was actually uh, been, been somewhat altered. This book you can get at bookstores today. Uh, it tells about the coming horror that is going to occur in the mass extermination of people. Uh, this book was published by the Lawrence Rockefeller Fund for the Enhancement of the Humanities. But in the original text, which we have, uh, she says this. Now, this book is... Uh, is channeled to her, uh, and she readily admits that by what she calls the Christ light, but I believe is the demonic spirit. And she is rewriting the book of Revelation so you, if you are an occultist, can understand it. She quotes Revelation 6, 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and the beasts of the earth. 
And then she goes on to say, out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend with all their heart, mind, and spirit. One-fourth, however, is resistant to election. They were attracted by life ever-evolving. Their higher self.